August 1989, Chillicothe, Missouri. At the end of a perfect summer day, the residents of Livingston County settle in for the evening. It is peaceful and quiet, much like any other late summer evening in this rural farming community. We had a close-knit neighborhood, close neighbors, no crime rate, didn't lock doors, didn't worry about your home because the whole neighborhood kind of looked after it. It's rural Missouri. Generally in law enforcement for us, it's 99% boredom and 1% terror, if anything at all. August 20th, the neighboring state of Nebraska. Police receive a panicked phone call from a drifter named Jack McCormick. McCormick is one of the many transient workers in the Missouri area. He uh, traveled around all the time, went from mission to mission and picked up odd jobs here and there. And that's about how they all were. All these guys were transients. You know, they all had families, but they didn't have much of a family life. Jack called, said he'd been working for a farmer, and told us it was Ray Copeland, and that he had had some problems with him. McCormick tells the police that Copeland, a farmer in Livingston County, hired Jack to do some work on his farm. According to McCormick, Copeland promised him free room and board and a salary of $50 a day. They said, well, here's the deal. I'll set you up where you can live uh, with my wife and I. She'll cook and wash and clean for you. We'll feed you. Most of the farmers around here get help locally. It's very common to have somebody uh, to help you out. Jack tells the police that Ray had another job in mind for him, to become part of a check forging scam involving stolen cattle. Well, they'd paint the barn stuff, then he would talk him into going to the sale barns with him and buying cattle. To Jack McCormick, it sounds like easy money. All he had to do was bid on the cattle Ray wanted and write a check. And he is desperate for paying work. At this particular juncture, there's no crime. You've committed no crime by going to an auction with me. This guy is just setting things up and you're helping him out. But soon, Ray's scam becomes evident. He would have them buy the cows. They would write a check. He would take them up to the bank, either prior to it or right after the sale, have them close the account out. Jack tells the police that Ray later resold the cattle at another sale barn miles away and kept the profit. When you go to a sale barn, uh, most of those people think, you know, they're, they're good down to earth farm people and they're buying cattle, so there's a trust factor there. And they're taking so many checks at a sale barn that they can't check each and every one of them. It worked pretty good for him for a while. After several days of taking part in the scam, Jack said he got nervous. He had already had some trouble with the law and he wanted to make a clean break. Jack indicated that he was becoming somewhat suspicious of the business arrangement and wanted to sever his business ties with Ray. According to Jack, the night he tells Ray that he wants out, Ray does not take it well. McCormick tells police that later that same evening, Ray woke him up in the middle of the night and took him out to the barn. He was told that there was a raccoon behind uh, a bale of hay, and, and he was told to go over and see if he could scare it out, and, and Ray was going to shoot it. Well, Jack got suspicious and felt like that he was going to shoot him instead. He turned around, this guy was pointing the rifle at his head. And he asked him, are you going to kill me, Ray? For some reason, he wasn't shot and he has escaped. The Nebraska police aren't sure what to make of McCormick's incredible story. As a drifter and a known drinker, 
Jack has a reputation for being unreliable. He was a typical alcoholic, the best way to phrase it. I mean, he liked his alcohol. He liked to boast. He thought he was a ladies' man. Jack appeared to me to be, uh, I use the word slick. There was just something that just kind of made me uneasy about his whole story. But what catches the police's attention is something else that Jack claims he saw on the Copeland farm itself. Jack said that he had seen what he believed was leg bones and skulls in these brush piles that Ray had burnt. Police have a hard time believing McCormick's accusations against 75-year-old Ray Copeland and his wife, Faye. Longtime residents of Livingston County, the Copelands are a quiet farming couple with modest means and modest tastes. These people were like the typical grandmother and grandfather. They worked hard. They uh, seemed to just lead real quiet lives. He looked like a typical Missouri farmer to me. He looked like a man who'd worked hard all his life. She looked like a uh, grandma that you would go to on uh, Sunday and for Sunday dinner. And... Ray worked all the time. Didn't do anything major, but he worked all the time cleaning farms up for people. Financially, Ray didn't have a lot. He lived from day to day like everybody else. Ray and Faye Copeland live alone. Their children, now grown and moved out, were brought up in a strict household. Whenever he would come home, that's whenever you towed the line as far as what you did around Ray. Now, don't get me wrong, some of my home life with mom was great. Still remember it today, but not with him. Although skeptical about Jack's story, the Nebraska police contact Gary Calvert of Livingston County. Well, Gary Calvert, he was our chief deputy. He took care of the investigations. Calvert is well-known and well-respected in law enforcement circles as an intelligent and detailed investigator. Not satisfied with what appears to be a kindly old farmer and his wife, Calvert follows his instincts and digs deeper. A different picture of Ray Copeland emerges. The opinion of Ray and with everybody in Livingston County is that Ray was, he was kind of a cantankerous old man. If he told you to do something, you did it then. If you didn't, you got to beat. Calvert initiates a thorough background check on the farmer with surprising results. He had had some criminal background. He'd had some check problems at one time. I know he'd filed bankruptcy a few years before all this happened. Faced with new information about Ray Copeland's criminal past, the deputy begins to suspect Jack McCormick's story about the cattle scam operation may have some truth to it. It made it a little bit more believable that there was probably something going on that Jack maybe knew about, maybe didn't, but was talking about it. A single phone call to the Nebraska police hotline sets off a chain of events that will ultimately lead the police to allegations of a multiple murder and possibly the bloodiest killing spree in Missouri's history. August 1989. In the peaceful farming community of Livingston County, Missouri, a drifter named Jack McCormick makes a shocking accusation against local farmer Ray Copeland. He claims that Ray tried to kill him after he walked away from a shady business deal. Deputy Gary Calvert wastes no time investigating the possibility that Copeland is targeting transients in a check forging scam. Gary Calvert was a very good investigator. I think most deputies or sheriffs uh, at that time, if they'd got this information, there's a good chance that it might not have developed, but Gary stayed on it and kept pushing and kept looking. Calvert's tenacity pays off when he learns that the farmer's livestock scams frequently land him in jail. Ray Copeland was not new to a life of crime. He had been arrested on uh, several occasions for theft, uh, and some of it was livestock. 
Ever since I remember, Ray would be gone every now and then. We were told he was gone and wouldn't be back for six, seven months. The next step in Calvert's investigation is to track down all the transients who had worked for Copeland. We knew we were looking for people that had been associated with Ray Copeland and had been writing bad checks for cattle. It is not an easy task. Calvert discovers most drifters do not want to be found, especially not by the police. There's really no track of some of them for maybe a couple of years, so security-wise, anything. And with them being uh, basically homeless people, there wasn't really anyone really looking for them either. Changing his tactics, Calvert attempts to track down the transient workers by contacting their families. Few of them had family members, they hadn't seen them. Most of the time, though, they didn't have family that we could find. The ones that did and stuff, the family members hadn't heard from them, and that was kind of unusual because they, they still contact your family once in a while. This raises Gary Calvert's suspicions. The transients who'd worked for Ray Copeland have one thing in common. They've all gone missing. They would be gentlemen coming to the house, staying through two or three nights, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Mom would feed them at the table, just like any of us kids, you know, part of the family type of deal. About four or five weeks, days, you know, however long he wanted to use them, and then all of a sudden they were gone. All except Jack McCormick. Gary Calvert is eager to track down the mysterious drifter who placed the original call to police. Jack is already on the police radar for writing forged checks in nearby Sullivan County, the checks he wrote for Copeland's cattle scheme. He was on parole, and because of the checks, he violated his parole. We issued a warrant for McCormick's arrest, then took that information and entered it into the uh, national database for wanted persons. Gary Calvert sees Jack's name in the database and contacts the Sullivan authorities. He lets them know he is looking for Jack. He does not have to wait long. On September 13th, McCormick turns up drunk on the side of the road. He was stuck in a ditch. I think he'd probably been out partying and ended up somewhere where he wasn't supposed to, and that's, they come across him that way. While processing McCormick's arrest, authorities see that he's wanted in Missouri. They contact Gary Calvert, and Jack is immediately transferred back to Livingston County. Meanwhile, there is a second break in the case. Police talk to a transient named Jimmy Page, who is currently employed by Ray Copeland. Page was a farm hand. They still had up here. They hadn't had him up here very long. He had just been doing cleaning around the farm, helping Ray like the rest of them. Page corroborates Jack's story about Copeland's check scam down to the last detail. They would go to a cattle sale. The transit would have two or three hundred dollars in their checking account. They would write a check for three thousand dollars. Then Ray would sell the cattle. Then these guys were left holding the bag. Basically, he had somebody else committing his crimes, and then he was the benefactor of, of everything. Led by Deputy Gary Calvert and Livingston County Sheriff Leland O'Dell, the Missouri police spend several weeks gathering evidence and taking statements from Jack McCormick. Well, he proceeded to tell about how this couple would go to Springfield, uh, pick up some transients, bring them up here in a cattle buying scheme. And then once he had bought some cattle, he felt like that these people were actually killing uh, these transients. Of course, as he's telling the story, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, you are crazy. That, you know, this rural Missouri don't happen here. Jack McCormick indicated that he was a shiftless person and was prone to alcohol, but that the information that he had to offer was not coming from any uh, alcohol-induced state, that uh, what he was telling us was the truth. 
at which point in time he talked about seeing some bones. Police get Jack to draw a map of the farm, indicating the exact spot where he claimed to see human remains. Confident he now has enough proof, Gary Calvert applies for a warrant to search the Copeland farm and to arrest Ray Copeland. Being in a rural area, we don't have enough people to uh, dedicate to a major crime uh, of, this, of this sort. Realizing this, Calvert and Odell call in help from other authorities across the state. The agencies involved in the search warrant was the Livingston County Sheriff's Office, Chillicothe Police Department, uh, the Grundy County Sheriff's Office, and I believe at the time the Highway Patrol may have been involved also. With the warrant in place, over 40 police officers gather in Chillicothe, Missouri, in preparation for a massive search of the Copeland Farm. What they are not prepared for is a crime that will grip this peaceful community in fear for their lives. A crime that shocked even the most hardened of police officers. Fall 1989. Authorities from across Missouri prepare for a massive search of the farm belonging to 75-year-old Ray Copeland for a crime involving fraud, forgery, and an alleged serial killing. Our best information seemed to lead us to believe that there was, in fact, uh, murder in Livingston County, and we kept our investigation going. October 9th, 7 a.m., police move in on the Copeland property. It was just uh, a typical rural Missouri farmhouse, uh, you know, had barns. It would just look like something a real old farmer would live in. The morning of the search warrant, my function was to interview Faye. Uh, Deputy Calvert's function was, along with serving the search warrant, was to find Ray and try to interview him. Ray wasn't there when, when we arrived. Uh, Faye was at the house with her for some time and talked to her. My first impression was she was just a, a little old lady. She's from the old school. You know, he's the head of the household, so she does what he says. And uh, that's, that's just the way it was in that family. Faye denies any knowledge of her husband's cattle scam. She told us we didn't have any business there, and you know she didn't know anything about her husband's business. I felt she knew what was happening, as what was going on. I, as she couldn't keep from knowing what was going on. At the time of the search, Ray is in town having coffee at the local diner. Deputy Gary Calvert makes the arrest. Ray was found, and he was. They were both taken into the Livingston County uh, facility. Ray was initially held on the check scheme, cattle scheme. Both Ray and Faye Copeland maintain their innocence when it comes to Jack's allegation of human remains on the property. Ray made the comment, we can look on his farm all we want, but we would never find anything there. The authorities inform the Copeland children of their parents' arrest. There isn't any one of us affected whenever Ray was arrested. But uh, being affected when her mom was arrested, yeah, each and every one of us pretty well des devastated about it. It happened to Ray all the time. But this is the first time that Faye was ever involved in it. Faye appeals to her children for help. Don't let them touch a certain item in the house. Uh, the quilts, take them out before they even get there. She didn't want them touching any of her pictures. Get them out of there. I can't do that, Mom. Yes, you can. Just go in there every night and take them out of there. No, I can't. There are police there all 24 hours a day. They're evidence. The major case squad continues their search of the Copeland property. We went out and spent several days on his farm out there looking around. We 
went through all the burn piles where he'd burnt brush stuff looking for bones. Cadaver dogs and backhoes are brought in to assist in the search. We dug holes all over that farm for two days, three days. It does not take long for the local news media to catch on to the police investigation. In 1989, I was a general assignment reporter at the Post. I was asked to go out there. There were a lot of locals there, and there was some media there. I really don't recall how it becomes such hot news so quick, but uh, we hadn't been there very long, and uh, the, the satellite truck started showing up, and, and it, it just became common knowledge. I remember the, um, the police officials being very cautious uh, because there were no bodies. All they had was speculation and a belief that there uh, may have been some people who were killed in the, in the area, people who had gone missing. So they were very careful in what they were doing, the information that they were releasing. And we're out here in rural Missouri, numerous television stations, with all sorts of press was their cameras and lights. And we were telling people that we was investigating a cattle buying scheme. But the word got out that we were basically looking for bodies, not officially, but everybody knew that that's what we were doing. News of the search for bodies spreads to the locals of Livingston County. I remember people standing on top of their pickup trucks, uh, looking with binoculars or trying to get as close as they could to uh, take snapshots with their you know, little cameras. There were a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation on what might be there. Some neighbors said it was just a um, witch hunt. Authorities make every effort to keep discreet and to stay focused on the task at hand. After nearly a week of searching, the police come up empty-handed. We never found anything on his property that led us to believe that there would be bodies there. Found several bones. None of them turned out to be human. Again, police wonder if Jack McCormick is lying to them about the body parts as a way to cover his role in the check writing scam. He was kind of the center of attention for a while, and I was curious or whether or not Jack was just playing up to us and telling us what we wanted to hear. There were a lot of people who thought that Jack McCormick was just kind of crazy that uh, for whatever reason, he was trying to bring attention uh, to himself. People were saying that we were foolish and looking like fools, and that's the last thing anybody wants to be done is made a fool of. And, and still in the back of your mind, you're thinking, are we chasing ghosts here, or are we actually onto something? Police are discouraged, but are unwilling to give up. They continue to follow every lead connected to Ray Copeland. The neighbors would tell us that Ray had access to a lot of the different properties, not necessarily permission to be on them, but would have access to them. Teams of officers search the surrounding barns that Ray was known to use and interview the farm owners. When an individual was interviewed and Ray Copeland had either been on his farm or done work for him on his farm. We would search those areas and talk to other people in the surrounding area to see if they'd seen anything suspicious. Livingston County is just covered with wells and ponds and places that, you know, you could put bodies that. Whenever I was around the farm, finding areas like where they had burned tires and uh, it had animal bones in it, you had a feeling like something bad had happened there. October 17th, Kurt Reith and Paul Stegmeyer, two officers assigned to the case, investigate a barn owned by farmer Neil Bryan. So we come out and investigated it. We pried the door open and went in. Took the steel rod and started probing around in the inside of the barn. Came across three places that was it right? I think law enforcement officers have those feelings whenever they work different things. It's like uh, being in a really bad place and you sense it, you know it. 
got a couple of shovels. We started digging. We dug down 18 inches to 24 inches. We uncovered a pair of tennis shoes in one, uncovered plastic in the other two. As the officers continue to dig, they discover the remains of three murdered men. They all, were all buried inside this barn. They were wrapped in plastic with their clothing on. The three men are later identified as 21-year-old Paul Cowart from Dardanelle, Arkansas, 27-year-old John Freeman from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and 27-year-old Jimmy Harvey from Springfield, Missouri. All three men are transient workers who had mysteriously disappeared. They are also former employees of Ray Copeland. I was so surprised when we found the three bodies that it made me a little bit uneasy with my judgment. <laughs> this is an elderly couple that could have been my grandparents. It just didn't seem possible to me that these two elderly people were able to kill these younger gentlemen and dispose of the bodies. The bodies are removed and taken to the local morgue for further investigation. Whenever the first body was found, my job was to uh, photograph the body and anything that he would point out, like if uh, there was a hole in a skull, from what we determined uh, through the autopsies in our investigation, we felt that uh, the victims died of a gunshot wound to the back of the head, probably a 22 rifle. We felt that they were not killed at the location that they were found. They were killed somewhere else and, and brought to that location and buried. The killings and the cold-blooded manner of the burials tests the mettle of local authorities who rarely see crimes of this nature. You know, I'd seen dead people before, but for me to be actually photographing victims of uh, a serial killer, it just was really strange for me. And I was asked one time if I'd ever had felt the presence of evil, which uh, sounds a little bit strange, but at that time I did it. It does not take long for news of the murdered men to spread across the community. We waited until the bodies had been removed, and then we prepared a press release and passed out the information. This caught a lot of people by shock, thinking that, no, this, this don't happen here. This happens in the city. Uh, but uh, they were proven wrong. Ray and Faye Copeland, already under arrest for fraud and forgery, are charged with the murder of the three men. The residents of Livingston County are shocked to learn of the brutal nature of the crime and the age of the two accused. What they don't know is that the police have not yet finished their body count. October 1989, Missouri police arrest Ray and Faye Copeland for the murder of three transient workers buried in a barn on a neighboring farm. The elderly couple are locked in separate cells in Livingston County Jail. It wasn't until the three bodies were found that this story became real for a lot of people. And I, and I think the mood of, of everybody, the, the, the press, uh, law enforcement, and the community, and the people that the Copelands knew changed dramatically. It was no longer uh, a joke and something fun and something kind of silly and something to, you know, to take pictures of and to look at through your binoculars. Suddenly it became very, very serious and, uh, and I think the community felt that instantly. The amazement of the neighborhood and the community that something like this would even happen in such an area. But what people have the most trouble believing is the possibility of 68-year-old Faye Copeland being a cold-blooded killer. And whenever they changed the arrest to murders, whenever they had mom involved in it, then it really shook me up, all of us. Ray and Faye Copeland deny any knowledge of the killings. Yeah, whenever 
Ray Copeland told me that he was getting out of there. That felt like he was being defiant, like, um, you haven't caught me doing anything. It's kind of like he was letting me know, I didn't do this, and I didn't do anything, and I'm going to get out of here. With the Copelands behind bars, members of the K-Squad continue to search the local area for other possible victims. Normally in a homicide investigation, you discover a body and you have a crime scene and you're looking for a suspect. Uh, in this particular case, we're in reverse. Now, we have two suspects. We're looking for the crime scene and the bodies. We went back to chasing leads just like we had been doing in, in the beginning. Our investigators were interested in searching any other barns that Ray Copeland had access to. We enjoyed great cooperation of the community that would call in indicating to us that Ray Copeland had been seen in various areas of the county. Our officers would respond to those areas and probe the dirt floors of the machine sheds or barns. October 25th, 1989. Buried underneath hundreds of bales of hay, police find another disturbing scene. We discovered the fourth body, later identified as Wayne Warner, in another barn. Warner had been killed in the same manner as the other victims with a single small caliber gunshot wound to the back of the head. Further investigation results in another discovery in a nearby well. Sam Stegmeyer, wife of Officer Paul Stegmeyer, is one of the Livingston County residents volunteering to help with the investigation. And they were all standing around the well looking in, and the light was so that it reflected off the water. And I happened to have a hood on, and that deflected the light enough that I could see the belt on this man, and it appeared to be a body. Upon closer examination, police verify Sam's suspicions. Only yards away from where the fourth victim was found, another body has been discovered. After carefully retrieving the body, police immediately send it to the county morgue. Whenever we got the body back to the, uh, the morgue, we uh, had rolled it over and he had on the leather belt that said Murphy on the back. The body is later identified as Dennis Murphy. As with the previous murder victims, Murphy is a former employee of Ray Copeland. The five bodies all have another thing in common. So we have evidence that all of the victims were shot in the back of the head. Case officers at the Copeland property continue to search the farmhouse. It just looked like a very old farmhouse. Hadn't had much done to it since it was built, probably. Every item inside the house is potentially a crucial piece of evidence. Before long, police find what they believe could be just the break they're looking for. That we found a, a small caliber handgun and a 22 rifle and I believe some type of shotgun. They were standing in the corner of one of the rooms, in, in the master bedroom. The bullets were examining, these were fired from this particular rifle question, and no other one like it. It's like fingerprints to forensics. We also found laundered clothing that we did not believe that Ray or Faye Copeland would be able to wear. There were several clothing items, different sizes of uh, blue jeans that we felt come from the different, different uh, people that had been in and out of that house. The families identified different uh, pieces of clothing that had been worn by the victims. I believe some of the clothing actually had some of the victims' initials 
in them. With the search almost complete, police come across what will turn out to be the most damning piece of physical evidence of Faye Copeland's involvement in the crimes. A list was found in the house that had several names on that list. And the, the bodies that we found all had an X beside the name, which led us to believe the X's meant that they were deceased. You know, and that was pretty crucial. And it was in Faye's handwriting. She obviously knew that these people were dead because they had been X'd off of her list. During the initial interview with Faye, uh, she indicated she never heard of those people, never heard those names before. She told the police, she told me, Ray told her, put an X beside. You got to understand how they lived, how they were grown up. You did what your husband told you to do. Ray could not write legible enough for him. And then they asked her, you know, well, who are they? I don't know, Ray just told me to write them down. The case against Ray and Faye Copeland gets stronger with every piece of evidence. If they are responsible for the brutal murders of the five young men, the question hangs in the air. How many others did they kill? There were others that had exes we felt like there was probably other bodies that we didn't find. November 1989, Ray and Faye Copeland are under arrest and behind bars. They are accused of Missouri's bloodiest crime in recent memory, the multiple murder of five transient workers. Authorities have built a strong case against the Copelands. Jack McCormick and Jimmy Page, two former employees of Ray Copeland, are prepared to testify. Physical evidence includes a firearm matching the victim's wounds and a handwritten hit list with the names of the deceased. The final and the most damning evidence is the recovered bodies of the victims themselves, dumped, discarded, and buried across Livingston County. Reaction on the streets of Livingston County ranges from denial and disbelief to cries of outrage. It was shocking. They just couldn't feature something like that happening in their area. It's just hard for people to believe. November 1989, the media descends upon Chillicothe, Missouri to cover one of the biggest local stories in decades. Of course, you're talking basically about a serial killer or serial killers. So it was big news. Reporter Bill Smith is one of the few journalists who managed to get an interview with Ray Copeland. When he was telling me that, uh, that he was innocent, I remember getting this kind of chill about him. And I don't know if it was his eyes or his mannerism or, or what it was. At that point, you know, I went from believing he was a kindly, grandfatherly sort to really knowing that, uh, that he had done what he was accused of doing and feeling very strongly that he had it within himself to kill these men over a few thousand dollars. Most of the shock and disbelief is saved for Faye Copeland. Still find it hard to believe that it happened. At that time, she would have been about the age I am now and I would just have expected her to be the typical grandmother. Believing Faye knows more than what she's saying, the prosecution offers her a deal in exchange for testifying against her husband. We thought that Faye would be the one that would be most likely to cooperate with us. Early on, the uh, prosecution had talked to her and indicated to her that if she cooperated with us, in uh, location of, of all victims that they would recommend a light sentence. She refused to do that and so consequently we had to do things uh, the hard way. November 13th, Ray and Faye Copeland are both arraigned on multiple murder charges and separate trial dates are set. 
As the trials go on, both Ray and Faye firmly maintain their innocence. But with overwhelming evidence stacked against them, the trials do not take long. By March 1991, both Ray and Faye have been declared guilty of murder in the first degree. Faye Copeland was convicted and received four death penalties. Ray was convicted and received uh, the death penalty on fi all five counts. The sentencing brought varied reactions from the family and members of the community. It was mixed. You know, it wasn't everybody jumping up and down and saying, yeah, they, they, they got what they deserved because some people felt like Faye was a victim. Even today, you know, a lot of people ask the question, well, why didn't mom know what Ray did? Why didn't she speak out? I think at last she did know and, and she knew how she had to tell somebody. She just didn't get it told quick enough. Whether or not Faye was actually there during that, it was never determined. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, she knew what was going on. Uh, she'll, they'll never convince me that she didn't. But uh, the way he treated her, though, it wouldn't have surprised me if he had her dig the hole. He killed a lot of people. No question in my mind. All because he wanted to be better than everybody else. Mom's guilty very simply of loving him way too much and not understanding that love is different than what she thought it was. Almost 20 years later, the impact of the Copeland killings remains strong in people's memories. Life will never be the same for many in Livingston County. The community I believe looks at it as like a black eye because we had a serial killer here. What makes the Copelands, Faye and Ray Copeland, unique in this was their age. Serial killers, you don't necessarily think of somebody 70 years old and husband and wife type uh, scenario. And they were the oldest people on death row. Uh, so it, it was a unique case. In the end, neither Ray nor Faye Copeland have to face the executioner. Ray died in prison before his death sentence could be carried out. <laughs> Faye's death sentence was, uh, was overturned in 1999, but after additional health problems, she was finally paroled to a uh, nursing center. In December 2004, Faye Copeland passed away of natural causes. There are some of us that still believe that there are other undiscovered bodies somewhere in Livingston County that we don't know anything about. It wasn't a perfect crime, but it was something that, you know, any person could see was doable because uh, who's gonna tell later? Uh, who's going to miss them? Most of their families had probably given up on them years ago. And I guess we grow up uh, believing uh, that if you're evil, that you're, or if you do something bad, you're wearing a black cloak and hiding in the shadows. And the truth of the matter is, is what do they look like? Anybody, anybody, anywhere. <laughs>